So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you're very welcome to this Protected Lettuce webinar this evening. Um, tonight, the focus is on Fusarium and Downy Mildew. This meeting, uh, there was a meeting organized by Stephen Alexander and the HDD on Fusarium about three years ago. Um, many of you may have attended that meeting. And this meeting is to update growers and everyone in the industry on where we are with Fusarium now and uh, the control measures that growers can take. Um, we'll also be looking at downy mildew, and as most of you be aware, Rhythm of Gold has lost its registration and can't be used after the 4th of January in 2022. Um, so some growers will be concerned about uh, downy mildew control going forward, and we hope this webinar can help us to learn more about the options. Um, so tonight we're joined by my colleague Andy Welton, who many of you know from the Horticulture Department in Chagask. Um, and we're also very lucky and fortunate to be joined by uh, Dr. Erica Wedgwood of ADAS. Uh, Eric is a plant pathologist, and I'll introduce her again in a moment. And John Johnson um, of Enzys Aiden, um, the seed company. Um, so without any more, I'll, I'll introduce our first speaker, Dr. Erica Wedgwood. Um, she, Erica, is, she has a master's in crop protection, and she also completed a PhD in entomology at Cambridge University. Uh, this was followed by 15 years at the National Institute of Agricultural Botany, carrying out pest and disease trials on new varieties and chemical products, working on vegetables, potatoes, oil seeds, pulses and grasses. Since 2005, she's worked uh, as an ADAS horticultural plant pathologist based near Cambridge, carrying out research projects and providing grower guidance on IPM. Uh, recent work has been focused on the management of soil-borne diseases and also on the use of bioprotectants. So, Erica, we're very lucky to have you here to speak to us tonight, and um, we look forward to your presentation. So, I'll let you take it away there whenever you're ready, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm pleased to be invited. Okay, then. So, the talk is going to be about, as, as you're hoping, it's going to be about fusarium and downy mildew management in protected lettuce. So I'm concentrating on protected lettuce tonight. So, this is uh, the order I'm going to be speaking. So first off, uh, talking about Fusarium oxysporum wilt and root rot, um, the symptoms and races, and uh, what we know about fungicide protection. Then moving on to Bremia, like Tukey, Danny Mildew, again, symptoms and races. But I'm also going to introduce a section on environmental control before talking about fungicide protection. I'm then going to round up with biosecurity and hygiene for both those pathogens and, and other pathogens. Uh, talking about propagation and cropping, and then um, uh, security, biosecurity and hygiene between crops. So first off then, Fusarium wilt. So this on the left is something I hope you haven't seen, but necrosis from Fusarium in the upper crown, uh, the crown and the upper root. So it will come in through the roots. Very often the roots aren't actually brown, um, but it will be attacking through the vascular system into the leaf veins. And the result will be this sort of wilting that you're seeing here, um, the older leaves wilting first, uh, as they'll be the ones closest to the, uh, where the vascular tissue um, is attached. But do note there is another pathogen, Pythium tracheophyllum, that can cause a lettuce vascular wilt. So if you're not sure, um, do get your material checked. So the actual um, full Latin name of the, the species that we're looking at, Euphtherum oxysporum, Former speciales like Tukey. And this is found in lettuce within Africa, Americas, uh, Asia, and Europe, and of course also Ireland and England. And the first thing you may notice is the leaves yellowing and wilting. And the telltale thing is when you cut the uh, base open, you'll see that that uh, reddish brown necrosis that I showed you a minute ago, um, followed by decay. And then you can see um, the necrosis of the vascular tissue in the leaf veins. Um, and it's this reddish brown color. And if you've got a severe infection, there's stunting and there's often death. And it seems that the butterheads are particularly susceptible, uh, but you can find it in all the lettuce types. The uh, former speciated Salis lactuki only colonizes lettuce, uh, so not spinach or rocket. Um, so that's uh, worth knowing. Um, at the moment, there's four, four races or possibly five. Uh, the fifth one may be related to race one, but uh, at the moment two and three are only found in Asia. 
Uh, race one is the one that we've been familiar with for uh, the most time and it's most widespread. And that was first reported in Europe, uh, in Italy in 2001. Um, there are a few varieties uh, that are resistant to the race one um, race, um, but those are mainly open field. There are a few for a uh, glass house, but it's mainly open field. So race four, which is the most recent one, identified first off in 2013 in the Netherlands. And then, and since then, it's been uh, reported from indoor crops, but isn't widespread as far as we know at the moment. But it is particularly aggressive. And at the moment, varietal resistance is, is being worked on. Um, the first time it was identified in UK and Ireland was in 2017. We think there was a, a crop in a, some crops in 2016 that uh, had wilt, but it wasn't sort of picked up as being anything different to that point in time. The real um, sort of um, optimum for the pathogen is the warmer soil temperatures, so 24, 28 degrees C. That's not uncommon for, use, for fusarium. It tends to like oxysporum, it tends to like those warm temperatures. Um, and as a result of that, some of the Dutch growers did stop growing lettuce in summer, thinking that they could again get away with it, um, growing them again in winter. But with this uh, race four, they were still getting 70% losses in December. And similarly in, in Lancashire, um, although air temperature in the glass house that was affected was only eight degrees C, they were still getting a high level of this uh, race four. So it's not just a hot, hot weather pathogen. Um, because it's already present, uh, so the race one um, is already present in European crops. Um, but it's been decided there's no need for statutory surveillance of the crops. So there's no reporting of outbreaks of any wilt race. I think that's something to, to remember because it means that there's no um, obligation to check imported seed for Fusarium oxysporum. Um, but if you're worried about it, if you do want to send your own seeds for testing or, or plants, they can be checked um, for Fusarium oxysporum by conventional and molecular tests. Um, and uh, people at the University of Warwick, John Clarkson, are working on uh, Fusarium oxysporum. And I think maybe we'll talk about it at the end. Um, they are willing to receive uh, samples of, of material. So control of Fusarium wilt is difficult. Um, as I said, it enters the roots and it quickly plugs up the veins. So it doesn't actually have to colonize, you know, like most fungi tend to sort of um, colonize the whole tissue and then, then kill it. This goes up straight for the veins blocks them and then stops the water supply. And of course the nutrients coming you know, back down into the root. Um, there is genetic diversity of susceptibility to this race four. And there has been some experiments screening. Uh, they've screened 52 lines and a number of them have been shown to be quite um, hopeful that there will be those, those lines can be used in breeding. And I think John's going to be talking more about that uh, breeding later or the results of it. Uh, there has been some AHDB work, um, CP1718, and this is a, a quite a large review that was uh, funded to look at um, ways of, of coping with Fusarium oxysporum. And in those um, that review, they looked at some results from the race one and how the fungicides uh, were effective um, against it. And the ones that topped the, um, the, the ratings of, of effectiveness were as oxystrobing and fosatile aluminium, um, but it is only re reducing the severity, so you can still get the wilting, um, and you do need to early on, uh, certainly as oxystrobing, pre-transplanting and fosatile um, straight, you know, straight away and then uh, repeating it. There is another option, which is trainum P. Um, this has to be used under full, full protection, so it's not polytunnel. Uh, giving a similar reduction or, or sometimes a greater severity reduction, depending on results you see. Um, and that can be done from sowing seeds into substrate trees, or you can use liquid application pre-transplanting. And you have got a, a one application on label use uh, in error. Some other biological products, um, Amylo X has been fairly recently um, marketed in the UK. We've had pre-stop for, for quite some time and T34 biocontrol for a little bit less. Um, the first one is a bacterial product, the other two are fungal. Um, they've all been shown in this uh, review I was talking about at the top, uh, do have some reduction in Fusarium oxysporum severity if applied to the soil or substrate. 
in other glasshouse crops because other crops do get these aeromoxysporum will not perform the species that we're interested in. There's a chance that they, you know, that results can be read across. There has been some work uh, specifically with inoculating lettuces in pots to race for in the Sector Plus project funded by AHDB and when applied to both blocks and then again at transplanting and seven days after um, the effect was as uh, very good uh, control but then, then when they repeated it um, in a tunnel, infected tunnel, the results were no different than untreated. So uh, it may be the different conditions. Um, sometimes the biocontrol products are also need certain conditions, optimum conditions uh, for growth. Uh, and actually, you're only allowed one treatment off label of that product. So you can't always do what the trials um, suggest that uh, will be ideal. Looking here now at what the options are. So on the left, I've decided to put what I was told were your products, and on the right, what we've got in the uh, UK. You can see across the top, um, there's no product specifically targeted at Fusarium wilt. Um, and you've got these two biologicals, the T34 and the Train and P that, that uh, mentioned. Uh, so it was over uh, in the UK. And on those labels, they do mention Fusarium but it doesn't mention fusarium wilt, as I've got at the bottom of this slide. Um, it's quite good for, um, it's quite well, relatively easy to control fusarium like Selene and other species because they uh, rot the roots and the reducing that will reduce the um, sort of the, the um, attack of the, on the plant. But because fusarium oxysporum gets into the veins, you really need to be uh, getting control at a very early stage before you've got any attack off the, the plants. Um, and a lot of these products do build up like a competitor um, organisms around the roots, which uh, compete with the fusarium for the entry into the roots. So you do need to get them on early. Uh, and often there's um, repeat um, applications, certainly for, for pre-stock. Um, I, there's no way I can talk to you about the whole of, of the things in this review. So this is the review, the HDP review. You can get access to it through that uh, web link. Uh, and there's also on that same web link, uh, quite a large document of what they're doing in Holland for their protocols and the, the basic list of hygiene uh, procedures from your um, Tigers company. Okay, so moving on to downy mildew. I'm sure you're mostly familiar with this uh, disease. Uh, here it is with the angular uh, patches. It's interesting how it does get delimited by the, the leaf veins and the sporulation on the underside of, of the leaves. And it is a white sporulation. Um, it's sort of, it's called downy, so it is a little bit downy. Um, it does occur both in outdoor and protected lettuce types. And as I said, it's got those pale green patches initially. You can see them from above, uh, but obviously clearer from underneath. And then particularly if you have cold, moist conditions, you'll see that sporulation developing. Um, you may just sort of bend the leaf over uh, of your finger and get your hand lens out to, to confirm it. Um, so this is a lower temperature that this pathogen likes, 15 to 20, uh, still sort of warmish, but um, it's not as hot as fusarium. Um, and the worst what conditions are um, in autumn under protection, particularly if you're starting to get sort of condensation, the moist air, and condensation forming on the leaves if they're cold at night and you've got warm, warm air uh, settling. It does need, um, down, downy mildews do need living tissue, they're obligate pathogens, uh, but what you will find is that botrytis grey mould, botrytis cinerea, will move in on tissue that's been killed by the downy mildew and that can actually cause, um, you know, quite severe problems following on from the downy mildew. Certainly the sort of, the, you know, the, the bottom of the lettuce can get rotted away. Um, Varieties are bred, I'm sure most of you know, to have resistance to Bremia lactuki and the, the poor breeders keep trying to keep up with the new resistances that uh, develop. At the moment, we're, we're lucky we have still got high resistance to the most uh, recent strain, the 37 EU, uh, and still to the older strains as well, which will still be around. Um, there is a project ongoing at the moment with the HDB, CP184 and 186. And in them, they're seeking to develop uh, molecular markers. So you can actually see in the DNA um, the diversity of the population of uh, Bremia lactuki. 
and also um, the fungicide sensitivity. And that will help us in working out integrated pest management programs with varieties and which fungicides to use and also um, ongoing for, for breeding activities. Right, now I've um, diverge a bit onto this um, environmental monitoring because I've been involved with this in a project I'm working on, on it's called the AMBRA project for HDB, looking at biological control. Um, and a part of that, we're monitoring the environment because you need to be able to see when the disease is happening to be able to put these bio, bio fungicides on because they're protectant. So we've been using this equipment that's um, uh, uh, promote, promoted by the company Fargro. Uh, I suspect there's other, other setups, but this is the one that we, we know of. And in that you have a, a, a screen in the, in the crop and also you can get a, a device with a little arm that um, sort of focuses onto the leaf. So you've got leaf, leaf temperatures. And that's important to actually have these measurements in the crop rather than uh, you know with your uh, private computers in the hanging in the eaves. Um, it needs to be where the conditions are, particularly if you're looking at condensation on leaves. These devices um, then send their um, information to a, a gateway by a bar signal. So in the office, you can have these, these gateways. Um, and then that sends by by into the into the cloud you know, wirelessly, um, and it collects the data there. And then you can download the data using a dashboard, either on uh, your your smartphone or any um, you know computer device. And that then um, can analyze the. You just see there a little bit of graph on there, uh, what the conditions have been like. It, you can set up alerts so that if you want to, if you're worried about a particular temperature or something, I need to sort of go in and check the the boiler's stopped or something. Um, you can set that up and also it can take data in. So basically at your fingertips, any, any time in real time, um, you've got information on what's going on in your houses. And that allows you to, to change the environment if you, if you need to or, to or to go in and check. I'll show you here the uh, users part of this that comes as part of it. These are sort of heat maps. This one is particularly for irrigation. You can see these are the, uh, some of the probes that were set up in the glass house and how variable the it's irrigation is. Um, and it, this is changing, you can get it as this is from 1200 to 1900. So you can get it just showing you can a little video of, of how it's moving. Um, so you can get those sensors, as I said, for temperature, humidity, and vapor pressure deficit. And the maps can highlight where the uneven areas are of watering or heat um, so that you can either go in and um, check uh, the, where those areas are, because you know that these stressed crops and they could be more susceptible to the disease, or if you're able to control particular venting in those areas or, or the watering, you know that there's a problem and you can change it. So um, that helps you to get on top of the environment, which means that you may get less moist leaves um, and therefore less disease, particularly for downy mildew. And here's a graph that um, you will get on your phone, for example. So the bottom line here is the dew point. And then the upper line is upper line is the surface temperature of the leaves, and this is actually for basil. Um, in, in the UK, there's um, a herb um, nursery that uh, uses this system, and also a, a large lettuce protected lettuce company, and as well as ornamental growers, and they're using these. And the, the uh, people go home, I think, with their with their um, things, uh, with their smartphones, and have a look, and keep an eye on these uh, conditions. Clearly, here somebody's doing it on Sunday. Um, and see that these two lines are getting close together. And this means that there's a chance of uh, wetness on the leaf, which means that if any spores of downy mildew are in the air, um, they will germinate and get into the plant and uh, cause infection. And this grower here has then adjusted, he's probably opened the vents, which means now that the surface temperature has gone up, uh, the dew point's gone down, and he's got this gap here between it. Um, so there's less chance for condensation. So as I said, you can, you can be sitting at home instead of watching television, you can, look at your skin glass house uh, conditions. Um, so this Sensi system is supported by Fargro um, and Siraj at Fargro at Provia UK is one of the people that I've been working with and I've sent some information through um, as well on, on, on your contacts in there. So we're moving on to fungicides. Um, so just to sort of say that a lot of the products that you are using were initially developed for potato blight, phytophthora, because that also is a 
oomycete. So it's not a fungus, it's uh, an oomycete um, like downy mildews. And they have this system for, uh, called Blight Spy, um, which growers can go on to on the HD website. And that warns about conditions that have been conducive to uh, potato blights of the Hutton period. So if it's 10 degrees C or more, or six hours above 90% relative humidity, um, there's a warning so that the, the potato growers can go out and spray. So they're not they're not spraying if if they don't need to. If there's no if the temperature is too low or it's not if it's if it's dry, then they don't need to spray. So in a way, you've got the same situation in your glass houses. You you um, can have got control over your temperatures to some extent, and also your your humidity. So you you've actually got control over when you can if you need to spray or not. Um, you, if you haven't got conditions for downy mildew humidity, then there's perhaps no need to spray. Um, if you do get downy mildew, um, then keep moving. Well, always look around your crops. I'm sure you do. And if you can remove any infected leaves, take a bag in the crop with you. Don't just sort of drape it around the crop on the way out. Um, collect those leaves and take them away and, and destroy them. Um, so if you haven't got the spores blowing around, then you're less likely to need to, to put the fungicide spray on. And you may just need to treat around those crops, not the whole, the whole crop. Um, so really, if your crop is at risk, you will need a fungicide application, and that will often be the conditions are still conducive. It is important to note that there are various track codes. I'm going to show you a table in a minute that will have those up. Um, so you do need to alternate them. Most labels actually say you can't have the product in consecutive applications. You may be limited on the number of applications. It's important to follow that because uh, we know resistance such, such as to metalaxyl in other crops has built up and then you just can't use the product. And that's one less thing that you're going to be able to use. Um, there was some efficacy experiments in the AHD product, project uh, field veg protected edibles 410 in 2016. And in that, they looked at various programs, and you can look at this on the HD website. Um, their program started with Amistar. Um, they were able to use Fubor Gold and then went on to Parat, which is good because it can get taken up um, by the roots from a drench. And then finishing with the Revis uh, because there were spores on the leaves, and that's a desiccant. Um, so there wouldn't be any point putting that on if um, you haven't got the spores on the leaves. Another product uh, in the UK is Karma, which is potassium carbonate. Uh, you can use it eight, eight times on the crop, but not, uh, not two, only two consecutively. And that light ravis is a spore desiccant. And it also has some effect on the, they say on the sort of the enzymes that the, the pathogen uses to attack the crop. And another one is uh, phytosave. And this is a oligosaccharide, which again is a bit different. It's an elicitor and that helps to uh, stimulate the plant to use its own defenses against uh, the downy mildew pathogen and other pathogens that might be around. So um, something, these new things, um, we're learning how to use those within programs. So again, the table as for Fusarium, this time we have got some chemical fungicides. You've got various ones, Soxystrobin, bother to read them through, but Amistar, et cetera, Parat, and you've, as you said, we look, you're losing that one and you've got these Rebus, Karma. Um, so we've got similar, the only ones we've got extra are the Phytosave and the Romeo, uh, which are these, uh, both of them as elicitors um, that uh, growers are starting to integrate into their programs. Uh, Parat, we've got it at the moment, but uh, we're aware that it's got a date of expiry at uh, 2025 and it may well, we may well lose it before then. Um, does it have aluminium? cautious about this use of these and any phosphites because um, there's you need to be very careful about maximum residue levels and as I said metal axile we have still got it but need to be careful about um, certainly using it as a as a straight as an active on its own um, um, because of the resistance uh, developing likelihood so, so you've got these various frac codes here there's there's different ones so that's different to to that one so that's good um, but you're you, you're sort of You've got different ones as well. So you've got those, those are the same. So that's, you wouldn't use those two close together. Okay. So I want to just sort of change, change track a bit and talk about these biostimulants. I don't know how many of you have actually tried them. It's a bit confusing. There's a whole range of, of products that um, 
you know, they will promote it on the literature and the magazines and things saying um, they'll help you make your plants strong and healthy. They've all got various um, attributes and some of them are mixtures of, of things. So some of them do various things. Um, but the ones that are actually all find registered um, as, as um, plant protection products, so for example, this Fighter Save and Romeo, um, have been shown to have this um, effect. And all plants, you know, they have their own resistance to two things. Uh, and by putting these products on early, it sort of stimulates the plant to, they say it kind of maybe makes the plant think it's going to be attacked. And it's kind of, it's a bit like a, a vaccination. It, it kind of warns it and it gets its uh, chemicals uh, going to be able to resist the, the actual pathogen attack. Um, it does tend to be used, um, integrated with, say, um, varietals. So particularly if you're using resistant varieties, that's, that's good to have it. You can't really rely on them, I don't think, um, although it's early days, on their own. Um, and they can be used, as I said, early in the programme um, or integrated within it. Um, I think really everybody has to try, try what their own thing, situations out because you need to be careful if somebody um, sort of says to you, oh, yes, I've been using this product on my downy mildew on my ebiz or something rather. Um, don't just sort of then go out and buy gallons of it and, and put it on your lettuce because um, it depends on the, the host species and the variety as to what mechanisms they, they have. As you know, you can buy different varieties with different resistance mechanisms. So it depends what you're working with, what how the biostimulants match up to the um, particular situation. It's a bit like a jigsaw. So I'm afraid there's a lot of uh, work, maybe sort of little trials you can do yourself uh, in a corner, maybe on something and see how it goes. Um, we did do a review, uh, CP184, again, available on the AHD website, um, managing um, management utilising elicitors uh, on downy moodies and late flight control. And with that, we did an extensive review and found that uh, there did seem a fair amount of evidence that the products there, chitosan, salicyclic acid, seaweed extracts and silicon uh, are shown to elicit defences in plants. And I previously mentioned that Phytosave and Romero as two that we can use in UK letters. Um, in fact, a bit of um, reading. Um, there is a 2016 report from the European Community. It's, um, it was to, written for the um, organic farmers and what products they can use to produce some of these biostimulants. And I think that makes quite an interesting read because they explain some of the ways the biostimulants uh, are known to work in a fairly sort of um, easy but easy to read form. So I, I recommend that to you. So moving on finally to biosecurity and hygiene. Now this of course should have been first, but I'm, I'm sort of tying it all up at the end and it's the most important bit really. You, if you stop the disease coming in, you're not gonna need um, the other measures of, of fungicides for it. So both Fusarium wilt and Danny mildew, you need to be careful about um, contaminated seed. It's particularly for Fusarium oxysporum though, and you should check with your suppliers that the seeds have been cleaned and actually request results for testing for Fusarium oxysporum. Um, Hopefully you're already not visiting other lettuce sites uh, unless you really need to, um, because you might pick up the uh, fungus uh, and the um, downy mildew from those sites and similarly restricting visitor access to your site, uh, or at least getting them to, to uh, disinfect their boots and, and perhaps put some ovals on. Um, the problem is that spores from above ground tissue can be carried by both wind irrigation and by people or equipment contacting it. So you know, you can't see them. It's just, they're just uh, there and you need to be careful of it. So particularly with Fusarium, they've got really resilient resting spores, the chlamydia spores they're called, and they can remain in plant debris, dust and soil for years. I mean, I've done experiments picking up some of these chlamydia spores and I just keep them in a test tube in, in the lab in a, in a bit of talcum powder and sprinkle them on agar plate. And next minute you've got all this pink Fusarium growing and they've certainly I've had them for five years. So um, and I believe it's a lot longer. So really disinfection is your good armor. Um, so in boot, boot washes, uh, hand, hand gels, and we're all used to sterilizing uh, hands now, aren't we? Uh, much as that can be done as possible. Certainly also glass house trays if you're reusing them, or if you're not, if you're buying new ones, uh, you know, keep them covered, covered. Make sure you're being careful also with um, where you're mixing, if you're doing peat blocks or something, where you're doing that, that your, your surfaces are clean. 
you do get problems, um, clearly distraction is uh, you know better rather than hanging around, sort of just leaving it wilting there. Um, catch it and and I said as earlier, um, bag it up. If you have got patches, you can use butane burners, uh, clay them off, but be aware that the roots of fusarium infection will remain in there and they will just um, rot away and, and the spores will form in the soil that are very resilient. So you'll need to dig those up. If you've got the chance to have a weed free fallow, then that's a possible option, but you will have to leave it like, like that for 34 months. Okay, so talking about now disinfesting of soil, um, as you're aware, probably we've lost basamid, dazamet, and that was pretty, pretty good at doing things. So we're having to look other ways of disinfesting soil. Um, as I said, because they particularly because of these resting spores that, that form in the soil. You could look at rotation with another crop other than lettuce um, for fusarium because it is specific to um, lettuce. So you could try a different different crop. Um, but really, I think if you're at, your main option is going to be steaming. Um, if you've got um, particularly a, a lettuce crop that's been diseased and you're going to follow it with another one. There's, there's various methods. Uh, I'm not sure many of you are aware of a sheet steaming. There are some other ones. I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute. Vacuum hood and sandwich steaming. Uh, it's available also. It's very important that you do prepare the, the soil uh, carefully with that so it's nice and, and friable, big air spaces, remove all the crop debris so that the steam can penetrate. Um, you need to make sure the soil temperature does exceed 90 degrees C 30 minutes uh, and to a depth of 25 centimetres because that will be uh, where your roots will be growing down to. Um, and you can buy some Mr. Pros now, um, electronic probes that are not that expensive that you can just sort of monitor how things are going under the, under the sheet if you're using a sheet. Uh, and the most importantly is don't then walk through the crop with your old shoes or allow spades or something to come in that hasn't been disinfected because you're just going to bring it back in again. Here's some big pictures of um, some, some kit. Most of you probably um, will be familiar with uh, steaming at some point in your lives if you've been working with glass house crops. Um, this does take a long time to inflate and then the steam's got to actually percolate down into the, um, into the soil. Um, so it does take a while. Uh, a better method is having this one where you have pipes that are buried in the soil either permanently or temporarily. And the uh, air is drawn down, the steam is drawn down from the central uh, entry pipe through the soil. Uh, and that, that's good because you can go very deep, as deep as you've buried your, your pipes, really. And that's called vacuum steaming. Uh, this other one here is a hood steaming. It's a bit like a big steam iron. Uh, it presses down, and the longer you wait at one particular point, the, the steam will penetrate. This one's got uh, an operator on it, but you can get robotic ones. Uh, and probably the best way of doing it um, is these sandwich steamers, where these... Um, pointers, these little spikes have got perforations, so they will steam right down to 20 cent, 25 centimetres and, and all the way through that soil profile. So that, that's a, a good one if you can invest in that. So finally, moving on to the action points. Um, so do as much as possible to stop pathogens entering your nursery in the first place. Make sure that all staff understand how pathogens spread. Um, some people aren't too sure, you know, they, you know, how how bacteria and how uh, fungi spread. If you can't see it, they don't not aware of it. And make sure they follow the hygiene protocols that you should have set up. All staff should be able to recognise diseases and pests so that they can report it and outbreaks can be stopped. Um, you should always be monitoring your crop and, if possible, alter the environment so it is less optimum for pathogens. Chemical fungicide application uh, should be justified, uh, not just, just because you feel like you want to, and any resistance to that product uh, monitored. Do try out a preventive application of biofungicides, um, then it's probably on a small area, see if it works for you. Um, look at them, make sure you read the instructions on those products. Probably best early in the crop to, uh, before it's really challenged by any, uh, it, won't, it won't be a curative, you need to have it early on in the thing. Uh, and so it can actually build up the plant's resistance as well. Biostimulants, as I said earlier, may be beneficial, um, particularly if the plants become stressed. Uh, it seems to work well in stressed plants um, because they are more likely to succumb to pests and diseases. And somehow these stimulants just help them over that hurdle. OK, I think that's uh, me done. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Erica. Brilliant presentation and uh, a lot of information in there. Um, so I just encourage the, the audience then just to, while we have the opportunity here to um, to have experts like Erica and John to, to engage with us and send in questions into the chat um, when we have a chance um, to pose these questions to these experts. Um, I just remind you as well that the, um, the link for registering for IASIS points is posted in the chat. Um, and just if you, if, you, if you want to register for IASIS points, um, just to follow that link and put in your details, please. Um, so thank you, Erica. And we move on to our next speaker, um, who is John Johnson. John uh, from Enza Zayden Seeds. Um, John was brought up with, within the industry. He was from, he's from north west of the UK in the growing area of Heskett Bank. Um, he's been with Enza Zayden for over eight years. He now heads up the Iceberg, Romaine and Glasshouse Lettuce UK teams. Um, he is also part of the global team within Enza and their digital assessment of variety trials and spent over 20 years with Royal Sluice and are now known as, as Seminus. Um, but he's here tonight to give us an update on varieties and serum strains. So I will um, let John uh, work away then in his own time. Whenever you're ready, John, please. And I encourage everyone to get questions in as well to Eric and John for the Q&A afterwards. Thanks, John. Just on mute, John, there, sorry. Still. Um, yeah, you must have uh, muted me there, uh, Owen. So, sorry, uh, sorry, John. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Work away. Thank you. That's okay. I'll just do that. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric, for your uh, well presented presentation, anyway. Yeah, just uh, I didn't want to show any, uh, any pictures of Fusarium. We're well. Uh, diverse with uh, what Fusarium looks like and the uh, issues that uh, come about it with the uh, you know, crop destroyal. And as like we say, we've come a long way since uh, 2017. Um, I'm going to briefly highlight some varieties, uh, present and, um, and, and future, and how we go about testing and how we confirm that it's Fusarium resistant variety. And then I'll go on to one butterhead and gem, which most of the growers uh, in Ireland are growing. Uh, anyway, uh, as you can probably see, um, we have probably just a couple of one variety which we claim as fusarium uh, resistance. That variety is called Jones. There are a couple of varieties from uh, uh, Reich Swan, uh, Duca, and, and Weldon. Uh, both summer and, and, and winter varieties. Uh, presently, Nunnams uh, don't have any resistant varieties, but they're probably you know probably two one or two years away before we the, introduce them. Um, with regards to Glasshouse Gem, uh, most of you are aware that probably we have probably a high percentage market share within the UK uh, and Ireland. And most of those glasshouse gem crops are grown within the northwest area of uh, Lancashire and the Rush area of, uh, of Ireland. And um, when Fusarium came about in 2017, it was, you know, basically there was one variety Sky, uh, Coventry, which dominated um, the marketplace. Uh, we came with uh, a, a couple of the varieties, Trigone, Scalpe, and Stunts is still available, but they're not as resistant to um, Fusarium as Alsatia, Altruist and Aikens. Aikens was introduced in 2021 this year. Both those three varieties have come from open field um, in Spain, um, breeding, and then they've been introduced to the trial process, which we do in, uh, in the UK and in Ireland. Now, to, as you can see the picture on the right, we go through a testing process before we can actually say that it's fusarium resistance. We test those varieties in several sites across Europe that are known to have fusarium, either fusarium one or fusarium four. Um, and until those have been tested and proven on those sites, we will not nominate whether they have fusarium one or four. 
as you can see that on that picture on the right there's 73 varieties so the breeders across the europe so whether that's glass house butthead we do testing for iceberg we do but butterhead testing for open field and glass house testing so we do easy leaf trials we do remain trials so anything that um is susceptible to fusarium one and four are tested in those grounds this picture on the right is from a grower in uh, in lancashire one of our sites we do two repetitions in the summer months just to prove um what resistance levels there are we, we we do have markers in there um alma is, is a marker which we know is very susceptible to uh, fusarium sky is another one uh, so we put those in the trials and then what we will actually do because fusarium is a moving object what you may find is you may find in as you can probably see this area you may not have fusarium but you may have fusarium up here so this is the issue with fusarium it's it, it can be localized within the one part of the greenhouse or three parts of several parts of the greenhouse so that's why we do the testing and we try and put um susceptible varieties between these beds if we can uh to see be, and see where the high you know when the fusarium starts that testing process will, will start in weeks of planting then we will monitor that over until the destroyal of the crop what we have then we'll also monitor either, even those varieties will get fusarium then we'll assess whether it's marketable or not so some varieties may have fully fusarium and 100 percent marketable but some varieties may be, and then that'll be off you know day three uh, week three week four or week five of that particular crop so this is the issue we have with fusarium um, and speaking to the growers in the uk and ireland you know it's not an easy crop to, you know, an easy disease to monitor because one we one variety may have it in one grower uh, and another you know that's um, susceptible to it and another grower down the road may not have the same issues so this is the problem we have with uh, fusarium and going back to the testing as I was going to say, before we confirm that resistance to follow, we have to go through that process, testing process. That's an Enzazaden process. Uh, I don't know the, the processes, what Reich's one and Nunnams do. Unfortunately, with Fusarium, there is no, as with um, Downy Mildew, there's, you know, the testing process from Mil uh, Downy Mildew with, throughout all the company is standardized. So we can test a variety from Nunnams or Rikes One and vice versa. And if we test that and it's, you know, as 37 uh, has been nominated this year, we inform those companies of what that Downy Mildew uh, has broken down with. In the case of Fusarium 4, or Fusarium 1, there's no industry standard amongst the seed houses as yet. We are working on that, but presently it's uh, we probably could be 12 months or two years off from that because going back to what Erica said, it's not a nominated disease that needs to be recognised. But unfortunately we do because uh, Fusarium 1 and Fusarium 4 is more so in uh, Spain and Italy in the warmer countries but Fusarium 4 is, is more localised to the, the uh, Northern Hemisphere, you know, UK, Ireland, Holland, Germany to a certain extent. Funny enough, in France, they don't have Fusarium 4, or we've never had, at the moment, I know of, so we've not had a report of Fusarium 4, which is, uh, now whether they integrate that with crops, uh, I can't say at the present time. Future-wise, um, in Glasshouse Butterhead, um, we, as a company, Enza Zayden, we are not, not breeding for um, um, Butterhead grown in soils, unfortunately. Um, and then I think that is amongst, um, we, you can, I can answer that question, question later. It isn't to say we're not actually testing for Fusarium for or breeding varieties. We know that where the markers are, as in the case of Jones and a, a couple of other varieties within this test, as you can see on the right. So there will be future varieties for Butterhead that can be grown in soil, but they'll also 
um, be more adapted to um, hydroponics, where the gr uh, growth is um, within Europe um, and it's slightly increasing in the UK and Ireland. And we all know the cost of uh, putting a hydro unit in, the costs are you know, substantial. With regards to Glasshouse Gem, we still have a breeding program for Glasshouse Gem, both summer and winter. Some of those summer varieties um, that have strong uh, fus fusarium uh, resistance, they, they are coming out of our breeding program in, in Spain. With our, uh, Victor, our breeder in Spain, Yuru, who's most of the varieties that have been bred for the Glasshouse gem production that have come about in the last 15 years have come out of his program. We are trialing new varieties presently um, to the standard types we've had before in the past, the Sky um, model uh, and the Coventry model. So they will probably come through in the next 18 months. We've got to, um, for this uh, coming summer, they're also fusarium resistant varieties. So I'd just like to reiterate, you know, we as, as, a, and, uh, as a company, ENSA are, you know, behind both still the Butthead program and the Glasshouse Gem program. So the future is, you know, still positive from our perspective. Um, and Glasshouse Gem is still being grown, you know, is increasing uh, worldwide. So some varieties may, we may have taken out of the pro, uh, portfolio in the past, like Trigoni, but then they've increased in other countries. For instance, Trigoni became a popular variety in Mexico. So a lot of the work that you know came about from growers um, like yourselves in Ireland and the northwest of, of the UK, those those that infancy has spread spread glo uh, spread globally. So I'd just like to reiterate that you know we are still breeding in in butthead and gem, and um, I can answer those questions later. Thank you, and that's probably my slide finish. And I think gives us probably five or ten minutes for questions. Brilliant. Thanks very much, John. Um, great presentation and summary there. Um, so we've time now for, for questions. And um, again, I encourage everybody to, to type their questions into the Q&A chat. Um, while we have Erica and John here. Um, and again, just if you do want the ACES points, uh, the link is in the chat. But um, maybe to begin with, Andy, we go across have you um any one or two questions coming in there that maybe people yeah, might like it, to pose uh, thanks on um well look i can see from the the chat there there's very little questions so i guess our speakers must have have either answered uh, the burning questions or things that were on people's minds or else they're still trying to digest all that information because there was an awful lot of um uh, information from from both speakers and i guess uh, it's fair to say uh, you'll be putting all this up on the website on for people to 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 view us at a stage when they at their leisure at some stage yeah yeah it'll all be posted <laughs> um the recording and the presentations and yeah. it will be posted on the website as soon as we can make it available for people to to watch back and and uh, go over some of this information again yeah so look while people are thinking maybe if they have some burning questions and and posting them Look, as, as, as our audience will know, and those that are in the business, uh, we went through a hell of a time three or four years ago when, when this was all very, very new. And it was very concerning then. And from the poll, we can see it's still quite concerning. But I suppose what's assuring is that uh, there's a lot of work has been done. We know more about the disease, but we're still, or certainly Fusarium, um, uh, Downey Mildew is as old as blight. It, it has been around a long time and, and continues to be a problem. But... You know, it's great that the work has gone on, but we're certainly not not out of the woods by any means. So, look, everything that was said back in 2017 in those reports that, that Erica uh, alluded to, you know, I would encourage you to go back and read those and, 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 and look at all that detailed information that's on those and what she has been putting up here tonight. But, Erica, one, one thing that, 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 that has come up there in, in recent days is um, you know test testing soils and you mentioned about getting the seed tested and getting seed cleaned and testing for for the fusarium in particular in seeds 
Is there a soil test or how far advanced is the soil testing or do we know, or is there someone doing that um, in the UK? At the moment, I'm working on a soil biology, soil health project, and they've had a, a PhD student working on the Fusarium oxysporum detection in the soil and uh, trying to um, work out different, better procedures of extracting it. So it still is sort of cutting edge of, of, of the science, really, of the soil extraction. Um, it, it is getting quite interesting that um, they've got like meta barcoding, so they are, are able to use DNA and work out the whole spectrum of things in the soil. So it certainly is an area to watch. Um, but as far as I know, certainly if, um, if you look, go onto the FERA uh, plant clinic, they're, they're not offering the uh, soil test on their, on their uh, front page. They do okay. do it for things like Fertisilium, uh, but Fusarium doesn't seem to be offered. But they will take in, um, they will tell you if you've got Fusarium oxysporum in your seeds or in your plants. Okay, okay. Um, thanks, Erica. Yeah, there, there's one or two questions coming in there now, Owen. So look, uh, we'll, while we have Eric, and I know Eric is under pressure because she does have another meeting to go to um, at eight o'clock. So look, while we have you, Erica, any chance of getting Infinito cleared for lettuce? I hear it's good on downy mildew. Infinito. Um, I, I don't, don't know. know. No, I yeah. don't know. Sorry, no. It's one that we can probably put to our people here, I guess. Look, currently it's not approved. I don't see it in the system where it's been looked for approval. But if there was enough, I guess if there was enough pressure um, uh, or enough uh, support for it, um, then certainly we can we can look to, to getting the, the relevant data to at least look at the possibility if people feel that there's a necessity for some for, further armory in terms of something like Infinito. Uh, but look, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly look, we'll, we'll pass that in to the, the people that will be able to answer that better and we'll get back to that, that question already, Eddie McLaughlin. Um, Owen, have you any more in there? Yeah, there's another question in here. Um, any comments on biosoil sterilants like mustard? Okay, so um, various people have, have tried experiments with that. I think the main thing with that is you have to get that incorporated very quickly. and It does have to be a warm soil uh, to get that biofumigation effect working. So it can be quite, quite variable as to you know, the effect of it. Um, I think that's the main thing that I've, I've not been working with it personally. Okay, thanks, Erica. Just another one here for for Erica and and, and Erica. If if you need to go, maybe th this could be the last one, because um, you know you're under pressure. But um, would you like to expand on the use of facetal al uh, and the potential issues on residues? I think uh, the best thing is to just do a, a web engine search to uh, find out about that put in <laughs> facetal okay. and, and residues, and you'll see there's a whole whole host of things being. Uh, discussed there okay. uh, it is the you know the whole phosphite issue of of, um, of, of it going into the plants and, and and is it is it safe or not and i think they, they've said it is at the levels that are accepted but uh, i think you're keeping an eye on it yeah. okay thanks very much erica um and i know you are probably it's just eight o'clock now so if, eric if, if if you need to go that's okay and, and any other questions that we have from the audience um for Erica, maybe we can uh, they can forward to us, and, and maybe we might be able to forward to Erica uh, at, at another at a later time and get back to those um, those attendees of Eric, if that's okay. Um, All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank thanks yeah, very I, much for joining us. Useful this evening. to most people. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you very thanks, much, Erica. Thank you. Thank you. Erica. Um, so we still have John and and Andy. Have you a few <coughs> question there? Sorry for John. Yeah, look, can I ask you, John, you're, you're, you're a Lanx man and you're familiar with the soils uh, of Lancashire and the organic soils that a lot of the, the lettuce, the protected lettuce is grown on there. From your experience with, again, wearing the fusarium hat on this one, is, is there a difference? And you, you've, been, you've been over to, you're, you're familiar with the soils that our lettuce growers are on here. Is there a difference between um, susceptibility on, on, on soil types and the, the chemistry of different soil types? No, I don't think there is. We, uh, I think going back to 2017-18, we initially thought that uh, probably the, you know, within Lancashire, there's probably several soil types from the, you know, the peaty soils, as we call the, the moss soils around here. And then you've got the sandy soils, the heavy clay soils. 
uh, up until we can't see any difference between them. I think that up until uh, this year, there was just one grower in the area who didn't have fusarium. Unfortunately, that went he went down with fusarium in uh, August, September of this year, August of this year. And he was a crest grower, growing uh, glasshouse gem, had been growing for for years, and he would be he'd been you know very clean nursery uh, because of his, his crest production. He was chlorinated in his water, he was double filtering his water, his UV in his water, and he thought initially um, that was protecting him from fusarium, and we really, you know it had done for several years. Well, for, since 2017, the first outbreak. So I'd say within Lancashire now, under the, the product protected level, we've got 100% fusarium you know, infected soil. And it doesn't matter um, whether you're on um, heavy soils, sandy soils, or uh, peaty soils. Okay. I'm afraid, yeah. Uh, and one other one, I, if you don't mind. Um... No nope. outdoor crops. I mean, I think someone mentioned that it, it, it isn't really a problem uh, on the outdoor crops. We have a few people that grow outdoor lettuce online here tonight. I mean, should they be concerned, or uh, have you come across it in your in your travels? I think the only concern is disposing of infected leaves, and I think um, I have seen it on, and it, I can't confirm it because it wasn't one hundred percent confirmed. Um, where a couple of growers had dumped um, infected debris from the greenhouse, you know, waste debris, uh, and this and it's, st- and it's still happening now on the land. So that's just increasing the prospect of fusarium for in being infected on the on the, on the outdoor areas. The the upside is because the rotations and you're only cropping in the six month period. Basically, you've got six month cropping and an six month cropping. Where on the on the moss soils, the peaty soils, where you know lettuce is being grown for as long as I can remember, uh, I've not touch wood. I have not seen an occurrence of fusarium in in open field crops. Okay, okay, thanks, John. Okay. don't see any more questions coming in Andy um, so I think unless anybody else has any more coming in in the next couple of seconds maybe they might have some more that they want to forward on to us afterwards and uh, maybe that we can that we can forward to Erica and, and John to, to maybe to ask them to answer um, but then I think we might we might wrap it up I think um, just to say that um, we do have another webinar coming up um, on the 7th, Tuesday the 7th of December, um, this Tuesday coming. Um, there we will be joined by uh, leading UK consultant Howard Hines um, of Root Crop Agronomy. Um, and he will be, fo- he will be focusing on um, virus disease in carrots and parsnips. The, the webinar will focus on carrots and parsnips. And we'll also be joined by Dr. Michael Gaffney of Chagask, uh, the horticulture department. Um, Michael is uh, an entomologist that many of you probably know, and he's going to give us an update on plant pathogenic nematodes uh, in root crops from his work on the EU, EU work on the Best for Soil project, which just recently finished. Um, so Andy, unless, I, have you anything else to add or are we happy to wrap it up? No, I think Owen. Yeah, that's that's yeah. great. No, it's yeah. uh, there's a, there was a lot of information. Like I say, I'd encourage people to in their own time. It's all on the website. It'll all be up there within a couple of days, including the recording. If you want to listen back to to what Eric and John have been been um, presenting tonight, and um, you know, a second, third time round, you take an awful lot more in. There was an awful lot of stuff there to take in, and in 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 the short time that we had. Yeah. Yeah. So um, well, we said thanks to Erica, she's gone, and uh, thanks very much to John Johnson from Enzo's Aiden Seeds, and um, really good uh, webinar, and thanks very much for joining us, and You're Andy welcome. as well for for uh, for facilitating as well here with me. Um, yeah. So thanks very much, and everyone, and all of you for attending and and engaging with us here, and hopefully you found it useful, and it's all available on the web web on the website shortly. So thanks very much, and uh, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye.